Okay, check this out. An infection that turns ordinary people into terrifying monstrosities is spreading like wildfire across South Korea. What you gonna do? It starts with a nosebleed until they transform into these unkillable, freakishly mutated creatures. Those who last 15 days without fully giving in become both human and monster, called special infectees. And anyone could be next, but is there any chance to survive? You're in luck because we're here to break down the mistakes made, what you should do, and how to beat every single monster in Sweet Home Season 2. This guy Hyun Soo used to be a gamer who lived on ramen noodles, but now he's one of these special infectees. After surviving encounters with both monsters and the military back at the Green Home apartment building, he wakes up in a truck that's been hijacked by a man who is actually a parasitic monster that takes over the bodies of its victims. Hyun Su tries to fight back, but the parasite easily kicks his ass while still keeping the truck on the road. The military chases after them, but loses them when the bridge they're driving on collapses. Unwilling to use lethal force against Hyun Su because they need him alive for their research, the rest of the survivors arrive at a bustling military checkpoint, but the soldiers there are just as ruthless as the monsters, executing anyone at the slightest sight of infection. While clearing rubble from the collapsed tunnel, these workers freak out as this lizard alien monster suddenly leaps out from where it was just hiding. The monster rampages through the crowd, but it seems like it's more scared than anything, only shoving people out of the way while trying to escape, and the military ends up killing more innocent bystanders in the crossfire. Okay, talk about a total disaster. These survivors here thought that they were getting away from the danger back at the apartments, but somehow ended up in a situation that's even worse. In the blink of an eye, this tunnel just turned into a death trap, and they need to make the right decisions if they want to avoid leaving there in a body bag. When it comes to the military, this whole thing could have been easily avoided if they'd only handled the situation with a bit more strategy. One of the things that we know about these monsters is that their presence causes radio interference. In order to check for them, they should have had a few guards stationed at the very front of the work line. That way, they'd have an early heads up if there was a monster hiding out in the rubble, instead of trying to get the situation under control after it's already started its attack. Which brings us to the next thing that they didn't consider. This wasn't an attack at all. The monster may be terrifying, but it's only acting out of the natural imperative to protect its child. We see this all the time with wild species like bears, which are generally harmless to humans unless they feel threatened specifically when it comes to their offspring. The best thing to do in these cases is simply steer clear and make sure that the animal has plenty of time to notice that you're nearby so that it can take its babies to a safer place. Attacking it only made things worse, and the right thing to do here would have been to call an immediate ceasefire as soon as they realized that the creature wasn't a threat. As a civilian here, things are even worse. This monster could easily kill you with one strike. Even if it's only by accident and you manage to avoid that, there's a good chance that you'll just end up getting shot. It's going to be hard to think straight, but panicking here is only going to get you killed. Instead, I'd immediately get to the low ground and try to find some cover, like behind a piece of rubble or the engine of one of these abandoned vehicles. You need to avoid getting trampled or shot and carefully work your way towards safety, while letting the military and the monster deal with each other. Either the soldiers will take it out or the monster will kill them, but as long as you don't present yourself as a threat, you should be fine. And in the worst case scenario, you'll be able to get some great loot from their bodies once things finally calm down. The monster ends up cornering this small child, but instead of harming her, it actually protects her from the soldier's bullets before safely returning the kid to her mother. Clearly the creature doesn't mean any harm, but the soldiers just can't take the hint. So it kills them and disappears into the tunnel, while the survivors from the apartment escape on the back of a truck driven by Private Chen Young. Once they're a safe distance away, this survivor, Hyun Yu, hijacks the truck with a weapon that she took from one of the dead soldiers, ordering them to drive back into the city without explaining why. Later, a special unit called Crow Platoon shows up to clear the area, where they find the monster hiding out in the roof of the tunnel. They quickly realize that it was only protecting its baby, and kill the creature with a flamethrower after forcing it to surrender by threatening the child. 
They're about to kill the little one too, but this Scarface Sergeant Tack sets it free, saying that they're only meant to kill the monsters who attack them first. Across the city, this firefighter Yi Kyung sneaks into a top secret base in search of her husband who used to work there, but disappeared before he could warn anyone about the outbreak. Inside, she witnesses a test where this scissor-handed monster is reunited with her mother, but the girl slices the woman's fingers off in the blink of an eye, and the soldiers ruthlessly take her out with their flamethrowers. Meanwhile, the parasite reveals that he's taking Hyun Su to the same base, with plans to free the monsters being held there. As they approach the gate, he's suddenly overcome by powerful hallucinations, and ends up crashing right into a squad of soldiers, forcing Hyun Su to mercy kill one of the injured men. For some reason, the parasite's powers have stopped working, and Hyun Su drives him deeper into the base, where they're both captured by the military. Now we get to see what Unhu has planned. She's taking them back to where it all began, the Green Home Apartments, to search for her older brother, Eun Hyuk, who went missing when the building collapsed. Inside, she discovers her brother's broken glasses, and a note revealing that he was succumbing to the infection. But besides that, there's no other trace of him anywhere. Back at the truck, the superior turns the survivors against each other with promises of a vaccine, and the soldiers regain control. Furious, he starts putting the beatdown of a lifetime on Hyun Hyu, but that's when the private steps in and stops him, saying that there's something he needs to see. The area is littered with bodies from Crow Platoon, and the worst part is they're still warm, which can only mean one thing an extremely powerful monster must be close by. Panicking, the superior orders Chan Young to restrain the survivors and leave them behind while the two of them escape, but he deliberately ties their hands loosely so that they'll be able to slip out once they're gone. Just then, one of their former neighbors, Miss Im, emerges in her monsterized form, covered in a strange white slime, but walks straight past the hostages without a second look. Insane with rage, the superior crashes his truck straight into the woman, pinning her against a wall. He's about to light her on fire, when out of nowhere, he's suddenly killed by the horrifically mutated blind monster, piercing his head with its tentacle arm. The others remember that this creature attacks by sound, so they try to quietly sneak away, but it isn't long before they blow their cover, forcing them to run for this nearby armored bus. In the chaos, Chen Young is constricted by the eyeball monster, but manages to escape when the blind monster slices it in half. Running for his life, he catches up with the bus just in time, and the blind monster is impaled on a forklift as the survivors speed away. Now, we here at How To Beat are all about staying safe, and the fine folks over at Exter, who sponsored today's episode, are most definitely on the same page. Exter is known for inventing the first trackable wallet, and now they're on a mission to upgrade the rest of your carry essentials. They're craftsmen of sustainable wallets, bags, and accessories that help you get more out of every day. I mean, these guys do it all. Check out the Exter Parliament Wallet, where style meets security. A world of sophistication with environmentally certified premium leather, ensuring you make a statement while embracing sustainability. Also, experience the convenience of an additional pocket designed for your cards or cash. Now everything you need is at your fingertips effortlessly. The Exter Parliament Wallet boasts a spacious interior that can comfortably harbor up to 12 cards and cash giving you the freedom to carry your world in your pocket. Guard your cards against wireless theft with state-of-the-art RFID blocking technology. Your valuables are safe from wireless monsters with Exter's RFID armor. It's not just a wallet, it's your secret weapon against the dark forces of technology theft. Lastly, choose your weapon of style from a palette of six unique colors, each reflecting a different facet of your personality. Don't be a victim to bland accessories. Embrace the Exter Parliament Wallet today. And lucky for you, they are on a big Christmas sale, and you know your ass needs a new wallet. Use my code HOWTOBEAT at the link in the video description to get up to 55% off Exter's wallets. Get the perfect Christmas gift now. Yeah, I definitely broke my extra out this morning while getting coffee, and I, I turned a few heads while I was at it. But that was actually after I got to the register and realized that I had lost my wallet. Luckily, I was able to ping it using the smart app in my phone and realized that it was just in my car. Extra man, you guys have thought of everything. Now, without further ado, let's get back to the video. Okay, 
That was a close call. Somehow, Yun Yu here brought them to the only place more dangerous than the military checkpoint, and she put everyone's lives at risk in the process. Very not chill. Now, coming here might have been a mistake, but it does give them some opportunities as well. After seeing how the military has decided to handle things, personally, I'd rather take my chances out here. And there's a lot worse places to hold out for a while than an armored bus. It's mobile, large enough for the whole group, and we could even make customizations like a rooftop garden or a rainwater catching system to increase our long-term survivability. With some minor adjustments, they could have a fully functioning community right there on the bus and use junked materials to build a cage in the back like in a police car, where they can quarantine anyone who starts to show symptoms. All that you need to do is scavenge for fuel and supplies, avoid the military and the monsters, and you're basically living the dream. Speaking of loot, not getting some supplies from the dead bodies of Crow Platoon is a seriously wasted opportunity. They have weapons and body armor, which are hard to come by and could be very useful to the survivors. Not all of them are professional fighters, but at least Yun Yu, Jisoo, and Shen Young know how to use the guns and could easily train the others over time. Also, the bodies have uniforms that you could use to blend in with the soldiers if you need arises and radios, which are great not only as a way to listen for interference from the monsters, but to keep track of troop movements and know which areas of the city to avoid. This place was swarming with monsters a minute ago, but they just took each other out, so it might be safe to have a look right now. We also know that these monsters sleep, so they could wait it out until they're all snoozing, and then quietly sneak back in for a quick shopping spree. Yeah. These monsters may be borderline unkillable to us, but we've seen many times that they can take each other out, and we need to use some of this to our advantage. Some of them, like the blind monster, are attracted to sound, so we could use flares to lure them away from us, or even entice them to attack another monster. If we run out of flares, it should be easy enough to fashion noisemakers out of random junk, like tin cans filled with rocks that we could use for the same purpose. The situation in the city may be bad, but if they use what advantages they have to their full potential, then they might be able to make the best of this monsterized apocalypse. Down the road, Chen Young stops to pick up a hitchhiker, who they find roaming the streets. The others are highly suspicious, but he's not the one who they need to worry about. At the base, Hyun Su is taken to meet with the head researcher, Dr. Lim. He wants to be used to help create more vaccines, but the doctor has other plans for him. Him. On his way out, the doctor crosses paths with Yi Kyung and lets her into the restricted area, saying that he was friends with her husband before he's suddenly captured by the soldiers. The parasite is taken down to the morgue, where he violently kills the researchers the moment that he wakes up. His powers still aren't working, but he drags himself deeper into the facility as they slowly begin to return. Night falls, and the survivors make a pit stop so that this kid, Young Su, can use the restroom. Just then, this guy Jae Hwan begins to attack, transforming into a terrifying long-faced monster. Shan Young and the hitchhiker manage to hold him off, burning him while he's distracted by his own reflection in a puddle of fuel. But it's already too late, and they realize that the boy's older sister was killed during the attack. At the facility, Yi Kyung finally finds her husband, but the news isn't good. He's been monsterized and placed into a test chamber for further research. As she's grieving, she's overcome with pain from the baby that she's carrying and collapses to the floor unconscious. The remaining survivors finally arrive at an Olympic stadium that's being used as a military shelter, but the hitchhiker is captured at the gate when he refuses to give up his weapons. Before they can enter, they're forced to submit to a test where their hands are sliced to check for the rapid healing that indicates the onset of monsterization. One of the survivors, this girl Jisoo, is almost taken into quarantine by the scientists. But just then, an announcement is given that they'll no longer be checking the refugees, and she's allowed in with the others. They've made it to the shelter, but the truth is that this is the last place that they want to be. Okay, they might think that they're finally safe, but my gut instincts are telling me that this is going to turn out bad, really bad. 
We're put in a hard position here because staying out in the city means that you'll have to contend with these insanely overpowered monsters. But we've seen several times now that the military can be just as dangerous. They may be in a position of authority, but at the end of the day, they're only people like you and me and they're just as susceptible to panic and paranoia as anyone else. Personally, I wouldn't be going anywhere near these guys unless I really had no other choice because I'd rather take my chances with the monsters, who I know are trying to kill me, than a bunch of heavily armed soldiers who could turn on you at any moment. If I knew that I was gonna be forced into a checkpoint like this, then I'd at least have taken a moment to test myself first. That way, I'd know if I was showing symptoms of monsterization and could avoid being quarantined, executed on site, or worse, taken to the facility for experimentation. Of course, you wanna stay human at all costs, but becoming monsterized isn't the worst thing. Because if you resist for 15 days, then you become a special infectee like Sean Sue, and if he hadn't handed himself over to the government, he wouldn't be doing too bad, all things considered. In a world full of monsters, partially becoming one yourself does come with some advantages. You'll be stronger and more survivable, and who knows, maybe one day they'll actually come up with a cure. But there's no cure for being executed by firing squad or burned alive, and that's why I'd be staying far away from anything that has to do with the military for now, at least if I could help it. Scarface here finally arrives at the secret facility, only to find out from his men that Crow Platoon has been disbanded. Furious, he goes to confront the general, who tells him that they've given up on trying to control the infection, and warns him not to go to the shelter, whatever he does, but decides to end things quickly without explaining why. Meanwhile, Dr. Lim is brought before a secret council of government officials, where he reveals that he's already hidden every dose of the vaccine, and refuses to tell them where they are. Furious, the prime minister vows to get the information out of him one way or the other, but first, he's going to completely wipe out the shelter to get rid of anyone who might be infected. Convinced that it's the only way to truly stop the outbreak, the Prime Minister pushes the button and a squadron of missile trucks begins to bombard the shelter, killing dozens of refugees with each strike. Jisoo spots a frightened young Su alone and rushes to him, protecting him from the turmoil, but she's trapped by a rebar spike when one of the missiles strikes nearby. Unable to move, she pleads with the boy to leave her behind, finally managing to convince him to get to safety, just as she's crushed by a piece of the falling stadium. With Dr. Lim still refusing to talk, the Prime Minister decides to execute him. But just then, Crow Platoon shows up and drops everyone in the room. After being shot in the head, the Prime Minister suddenly transforms into a monster with tentacles coming out from his mouth. But the soldiers kill him with a flamethrower before gathering any useful supplies that they can find and then escaping as they demolish the place with timed explosives. Having regained his abilities just in time, the parasite moves through the facility setting all of the monsters free before stopping for a final confrontation with Hyun Su. He decides to leave them behind, but Hyun Su breaks through the glass and attacks with a giant monsterized wing as the two of them battle to the death. The fight is brutal, but it looks like Hyun Su is going to win until the parasite suddenly uses his powers to meld with his monsterized arm, turning him to stone and crushing him under an automatic door. Yi Kyung wakes up as the facility collapses, escaping onto a frozen lake where she unexpectedly gives birth, and is horrified to see that the child is already monsterized. The remaining members of Crow Platoon gather the survivors from the shelter and make their way into the subway tunnels. Underground, they find that another group of survivors has already set up a community theater, and the two factions decide to join together. Almost a year passes as the soldiers of Crow Platoon begin enforcing martial law over the survivors in the tunnels. Although they used to allow civilians to scavenge for supplies above ground, they've recently stopped letting anyone go to the surface, saying that it's for their own safety. 
Fed up with the new rules, these two weirdos decide to go to their original leader, Chief Yi, who agrees to help, but under one condition. She wants them to keep an eye on Yun Yu, who she wrongly believes killed her husband in a suspicious incident. Later on, they follow Yun Hyu into a secret tunnel leading up to the surface that Crow Platoon hasn't discovered. That's when they notice that they've been followed, too. But it's only this innocent guy, Jun Il, who wants to get some medicine for his dying mother, and they let him tag along with plans to use him as a meat shield if anything goes wrong. The weirdos tail Yun Yu through the streets as she follows a trail of red cloth that she's been using to mark her path. Eventually, they come to a small grocery store, where this guy in the jersey gets a big idea. He wants to kill Yun Yu. That way, they can impress the chief and keep all of the supplies for themselves. Outside, Jun Il finds a rifle on one of the dead soldiers, but Jersey here abruptly takes it for himself. As the weirdos close in on Yun Yu, Jun Il suddenly turns in another direction and takes off on his own. Yun Yu spots the other two coming towards her, but she manages to lose them by hiding out among the wrecked cars. Okay, these guys are total douchebags, and they've been making some terrible calls uh, the whole way. First off, picking on Jun Il here is just wrong. I'd be the first person to bring in a meat shield when the situation calls for it, or someone actually deserves it, but this guy doesn't know any better, and he's just trying to help his mom. No one else may be watching, but karma is a bitch, and in an apocalypse like this, it's best not to push your luck by making such legitimately evil choices, because sooner or later, it's gonna come back to bite you. Now, that's not to say that bringing a meat shield along was a bad idea. They just should have picked someone who was better suited for the job. The tunnels are full of survivors who are just chomping at the bit for a chance to go scavenge for some good loot. So it couldn't have been too hard for these two to find another body to bring with them as a sacrifice if things go wrong. But they need to keep the circle tight because if too many people find out about the exit, it'll only be a matter of time before they blow up the spot and get everyone in trouble. Or worse, accidentally let something dangerous in. As far as hitmen go, I wouldn't hire these guys for a pack of chewing gum. They already know the path that Yun Yu takes and where her secret exit is. So once they reached the grocery store, they could have just easily waited for her to come back and got her on the return trip instead of following her deeper into the dangerous city. Not only are these guys evil, but they're dumb too, and they're going to get what's coming to them soon enough. Now, as for Yun Yu, she might want to check to see if she's being followed just a little bit sooner next time. After all, we later find out that the chief herself is one who told her about the exit. And why would she do that if she thinks that this girl killed her husband? Clearly, the chief wants her to get killed out there, which means that she can never be too careful. Yun Yu is doing all of this to find her brother, but let's not forget that the last time that she saw him was in an apartment building that was swarmed with bloodthirsty, unkillable monsters, raided by ruthless bandits, and then collapsed. And it's been a full year since then. I hate to be the bearer of bad news here, but that guy is dead, or worse. It's time for Yun Yu to move on with her life and stop taking unnecessary risks. Because as her older brother, that's what he'd want her to do. Meanwhile, Jun Il arrives at an abandoned greenhouse where he finds a mysterious young girl with a mitten necklace peacefully sleeping amongst the flowers. Curious, he reaches down to touch a strange scar on her arm, but that was his biggest mistake. Suddenly, the girl wakes up as her eyes glaze over white and she pushes him away. Returning to normal, she stands up saying that what just happened isn't her fault and leaves Jun Il there stunned with blisters already forming on his arm in the spot where she touched him. Back at the shelter, Jun Il's sick mother convinces the chief to let her come to the surface with a work crew. The moment that they let their guard down, the old woman takes off running towards the perimeter, but stops in her tracks when she accidentally steps on a landmine. It turns out that she wanted to disappear quietly so that her son wouldn't have to watch her suffer. Now that she's staring death in the face, she's terrified, but Chan Young refuses to leave her side. Sergeant Tak arrives on the scene, and they manage to save her life, but the woman is showing signs of monsterization, so they're forced to quarantine her anyway. Yun Yu hides out in a factory, where she's pushed off of a beam by the baby lizard monster and knocked unconscious from the fall. On the ground floor, the two weirdos see the Mittens girl approaching them and open fire. 
This guy in the polo goes to see if she's alright, but she mind controls him forcing him to kill his friend in the jersey. When she wakes up, Yun Yu realizes that the factory is swarming with dozens of beast-like looking monsters and tries to run for her life, but she isn't able to get away. Just when it looks like it's all over, she's suddenly saved by an unseen infectee. Thinking that it could be her brother, she runs outside after him, begging for him to show himself. But instead, she sees the Mittens girl watching her. Somehow, the girl recognizes her, although Yun Yu is sure that they've never met. Confused, she reaches out to grab the girl's shoulder, but the lizard baby tackles Yun Yu to the ground, leaving her as Mittens and her monster friends disappear down the alley. The shelter is about to be in big trouble, as the explosion from the landmine alerts every monster in the city, but a squad led by second-in-command Sergeant Kim lures the monsters toward a gas station. There, they rig pumps with C4 and set off a few more small explosions to get the monster's attention. The beast-like monsters quickly swarm the place, and after retreating to a safe distance, Kim fires his rifle into the explosives, killing them all in a massive fireball. It's a major victory, but now they're running low on supplies, meaning that they'll have to be careful to avoid any unnecessary fights. On their way back, the soldiers find Junil wandering the streets alone and bring him back to the shelter. The man needs medical attention, so Chen Young brings him to see the scientist Dr. Lim, who's taken over as the shelter's physician. Lim could care less at first, but becomes very interested when they notice the strange scar on his arm, and decides that the man should stay there while he does further tests. On his way out, Chen Young asks the doctor if it's theoretically possible for a monster to choose to protect someone. And although the doctor thinks that any case of this is most likely nothing but but a coincidence. He tells Shen Yang to report back if he sees this choosing creature again, saying that it could be the key to finding a cure. While running some tests on Junil, Dr. Lim notices something strange about his blood. The man has been infected, but somehow he isn't showing any symptoms. Instead of trying to help him, he decides that he's going to intentionally provoke Junil into monsterizing to see what he can learn. Okay, this poor guy Junil can't catch a break and I feel pretty bad for him. Somebody needs to take the rubbing alcohol away from Dr. Lim here because he's been hitting the bottle a bit too hard if you ask me. After all, nothing screams dangerous maniac like thinking that it's a good idea to deliberately turn someone into a monster. He's acting like a total psycho and he's about to make a huge mistake. The doctor just found out that Junil here has become infected without showing any symptoms of monsterization. And uh, there's a good chance that whatever happened to him could be a huge breakthrough in terms of understanding and one day possibly even curing the disease. Not only would forcing him to monsterize be downright evil, but it would also be a massive waste of their best opportunity yet. If he really believes that Junil here knows something useful, then he needs to keep him sane for as long as possible so that he can learn more about what actually happened to him while he was out in the city. Instead of using him as a test subject in another one of his twisted experiments, he should quickly inform the military about what he's just discovered. That way, they can help him make the most of this unique opportunity to find a cure. He may not remember much about what happened to him out there, but with a bit of patience and some careful planning, they might be able to take Junil here on an expedition to retrace his steps and see what they can find. Meanwhile, Shen Young learns that Yun Yu has been sneaking out on her own and decides to follow her. He finds her at the secret exit from the tunnels, where he asks her about the special infectee that she's been looking for. Just then, they see the Mittens girl watching them, and she tells Yun Yu that she can help her find her brother, but Shen Young stops her just as a stranger emerges from the darkness, demanding that the girl comes with her. The stranger turns out to be Yi Kyung, who Yun Yu recognizes from the apartments, but she takes the girl and disappears while refusing to explain why. Desperate for answers, Yun Yu grabs her gear and chases after her, with Chen Young following close behind. As Yun Yu tries to lose him, she stumbles and falls into a pit trap full of spikes. Chen Young catches her just in time, saving her life, only for he himself to then be pushed by a stranger in a ghillie suit. Luckily, he's able to grab a hold of a pipe, and they manage to avoid falling into the spikes, but the stranger leaves them trapped there with no way to climb back out. 
Okay, and this right here is why we don't go chasing after dangerous monsters and gun-toting survivors through uncharted territory in the dead of night. The hard truth of the matter is that they only escaped being killed here by blind luck, and the bottom of a pitfall trap is the absolute last place that you want to be under any circumstances. Let alone when the world has been taken over by deranged freaks and blood-crazed monsters. If they want to survive this, then they can't stay here long because no one else is coming to help them. And it's only a matter of time before a monster or whoever made the trap comes along to finish the job. But the good news is that they might have everything that they need to escape right there. The trap is designed to kill you instantly when you fall in, but by avoiding the spikes, they've actually cheated death. Now it's time to use those spikes to their advantage. It looks like there's enough of them down there that if they can dig them out of the dirt and wedge them into a corner of the pit, they might be able to create a makeshift ladder to help them climb back out and boost each other up if they need extra help. Huh? 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 Yeah. See? Ladder. If this works, then they could also take several of the spikes to use as spears to protect themselves while they make their way back to the shelter, which is where they should be going right away, because clearly going after the Mittens girl is only going to end with one of them getting killed. Trying to monsterize Junil, the doctor sneaks him outside to see his mother, and it turns out that he actually wanted her to die so that she'd no longer be sick. Seeing that she's suddenly starting to recover, Janil begins to monsterize himself, tearing off the door to her cell with his bare hands, before violently killing her with a sharp piece of rebar. As the doctor looks on, Janil is so overcome with anger that he literally explodes from rage. Showering the doctor in his blood, he runs to get Sergeant Tack, but the man refuses to acknowledge what really happened there. Instead, he burns the bodies and decides that they're going to cover it up by telling the public that the women simply gave in to the infection and killed her son, saying that the people will lose all hope and the shelter will fall into chaos if they find out that someone can monsterize without showing any symptoms. Down in the pit, Shenyang and Yun Yu start to talk about the special infectee that's been protecting her. Although she doesn't know for sure, she wants to believe that it's her missing brother. Just then, someone throws a rope down into the hole, and the two of them work together to climb back out. When Shen Young finally makes it up, they're nearly attacked by a camouflaged monster, but someone scares it off by lighting it on fire with gasoline. It's the hitchhiker Ho Song, who's teamed up with a strange girl named Hani. The girl takes a liking to Shen Young, so they end up taking the two of them hostage, with Ho Song saying that they need to pay him back for destroying his trap, but promising to let Young Yu leave the next morning. Okay, these two just became guests at the worst Airbnb on the planet, and if you ask me, I'd say that it's time for an early checkout. This hitchhiker here is badass, and he could easily be a powerful ally if the circumstances were different. But the fact is that he can't be trusted. After all, he did push them down into the pit when he could have easily helped them up instead. And that should pretty much tell you everything that you need to know about his survival strategy. Anyone who's made it this long out in the wild without being killed by the monsters is capable of doing whatever it takes to survive. And there's no way to tell what he has planned for them, so it's better to escape while they have the chance than stick around and find out. He may have their hands tied behind their backs, but he left them unguarded in a shed full of everything that they need to escape. It's time to put their differences aside for now and work together to get out of there. Whether they go their separate ways after that or not is something that they can figure out later. They'll need to be quiet so as not to draw attention from a monster or their hostage takers. But something like the broken piece of ceramic from the toilets behind them could be used to cut their restraints. Then they could try climbing the shelves to push their way out through a loose section of the roof, or wait for one of their captors to come back and then ambush them with anything that they could find for a weapon. The hitchhiker might not have killed them outright, but he lost his chance to play nice when he decided to take them prisoner. And I'd be willing to take him out if that's what we had to do to ensure my own and safety. Yi Kyung takes Mittens back to the boat where she lives and locks the girl in a room to protect her from the humans. It's revealed that the girl is actually her child who was born already monsterized and first used her powers when they were attacked by bandits, causing her to rapidly age. 
While Yi Kyung is sleeping, the girl lights her room on fire to escape. The lizard baby comes to help, but Yi Kyung sees it as a threat and tries to kill it, which upsets the girl so much that she jumps from the boat and disappears. That night, Hani returns to the shed and lets Yun Yu go free. She promises to let Shan Yu go too, but first, she wants him to have some soup. Sure enough, the girl has put something in it, and he passes out the moment he takes a sip. In the tunnels, Lim finds Sergeant Tack starting to succumb to monsterization himself, and says that he might be able to help in exchange for getting to leave the shelter. Yun Yu makes her way to the greenhouse, where she's suddenly confronted by mittens. Angry with her, the girl shoves her into a ravine, but she's saved at the last moment by the special infectee, who turns out to be her old friend, Hyun Su. Through a flashback, it's revealed that Yi Kung tried to kill her daughter at first, but tried to let her live with Hyun Su instead until they eventually reconnected. When the bandits attacked, she gave the girl a scar so that she'd always be able to recognize her no matter how she changed but the girl became frightened of her and ran off. After rescuing Yun Yu, Hyun Su learns from Mittens that her mother is in danger and rushes to the boat. There he finds the lizard baby still trying to save her and rescues them both just in time. Back at the hitchhiker's camp, Yun Yu finds Shan Young in bad shape. It turns out that the girl accidentally overdosed him, but they're able to revive him with a special herb. Later that night, as the two are getting ready to leave, Hyun Su shows up carrying a badly injured Yi Kyung on his back to ask for their help. Distrustful of anyone who's been monsterized, the old man blasts Hyun Su with a shotgun, injuring him, and he and the crazy girl take off in their truck, leaving the others to fend for themselves. At the shelter, the soldiers receive a distress call from one of the men who went missing while looking for the medicine for his injured girlfriend and it's coming from the destroyed facility. In a hurry, Sergeant Kim sets out with a few of his men and Dr. Lim to search for their missing comrade, while Sergeant Tak stays behind to watch over the tunnels. While approaching the facility, they're suddenly attacked by a horde of beast-like monsters that chase after their jeeps. The soldiers manage to hold them off, but the doctor points out that this is the first time he's seen monsters working together, almost as if they were protecting something. When Kim and his team arrive at the facility, they're surprised to find the place completely overtaken by nature, although it's only been a year since the site was abandoned. Once inside, they decide to split up, with Kim and his friend Seok Chan accompanying the doctor to his old lab, while the others search for the missing man. Okay, these guys seem to know what they're doing, but personally, there's a number of reasons why I would think twice before deciding to split up. There's no way to know what they're gonna find down there, and they need to keep the doctor alive, even if he is a total psycho, because he's their best and only hope at eventually coming up with a cure. Instead of splitting up, what they really need to do here is stick together and go about the search in a more organized fashion. The first step would be setting up like a base camp at the entrance with communication back to the main shelter, and then carefully making their way through the facility as a group. Right? 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 I mean, come on. What, what, pff, come on. They could even recruit survivors from the shelter to support them now that their numbers are starting to fade. The platoon may be low on men, but they should be able to round up some weapons and supplies by scavenging from their dead bodies at any kill sites. Otherwise, they could arm the civilian recruits with melee weapons, homemade flamethrowers, or even just your standard torches, which are a certified monster hunting classic, and put them on the front lines as cannon fodder to support the soldiers while minimizing the losses of their professional fighters. Deep within the bunker, the search team comes to a body-littered hall when a doorway behind them mysteriously creaks open. One of the men checks it out, only for them to be separated from the others. And when they get inside, they find him suspended in a monsterized cocoon. They try to pull him down, but it's no use, and they're forced to retreat as a blob of red slime begins chasing after them. Meanwhile, Kim and the doctor find even more cocoons and realize that the monsters are changing. Refusing to leave without finding what he came for, Lim stays behind with a radio while the soldiers go to rescue their friends. 
In the city, Hyun Soo and the others come to a medical building where they try to use an oxygen tank to save Yi Kyung from carbon monoxide poisoning, but the tank is empty and the woman is in bad shape. Leaving the others to watch over her, Hyun Soo returns to the greenhouse to find mittens and convinces the girl to come say goodbye to her mother. The girl stays by her mother's side until the end, but when she leaves the room, the others realize the horrifying truth. The girl has just turned her own mother into a monster. Hyun Soo is forced to battle her as she unsuccessfully tries to resist the transformation, and it ends with him throwing her down into a pit into the road. Heartbroken after what he's had to do, Hyun Su collapses from exhaustion and Shen Young returns to the shelter while Yun Yu chooses to stay by his side. Okay, this was really tragic, but it also might be a sign of their best chance yet to find a cure. Think about it this way, if Mitten's girl here can jumpstart the monsterization process in uninfected humans, then it's possible that she also holds the key to curing it by reverse engineering her powers. They need to bring her in for research, but tracking her down is going to be dangerous because she can turn anyone she touches into a monster, unless that person is already resisting monsterization themselves. So Han Su or Sergeant Kim here could be the perfect candidates for the job, especially since they're already willing to sacrifice everything to help find a cure. Based on what we've seen of her so far, she's not gonna be brought in willingly, but we already know her biggest weakness. The girl does have to sleep like a normal person, so they could try following her until she takes a nap and then carefully grabbing her while she's unconscious for extra safety. At the secret facility, the search teams come to an area where the floor has collapsed and down below they can see two rooms, one with infectees and one with people who've been fully monsterized, as if someone intentionally separated the groups. One of the soldiers is grabbed, but they managed to get away just as this stranger in a suit tells them to follow him to safety, only to leave them both trapped in one of the labs. Moments later, they hear a strange noise coming from the other side of the door and immediately open fire. Terrified, one of them looks out through the bullet hole, but he's suddenly grabbed by a red tentacle and lifted up to the ceiling. Meanwhile, in another lab, Sergeant Kim finds a girl who appears to be a human hiding out in one of the lockers. She says that she's seen their missing friend and agrees to bring them to him. As the two of them follow her deeper into the facility, the girl brings them to a room where they find the missing soldier being held prisoner. Determined to get him out, Sergeant Kim orders the girl to bring him to someone who can open the door, while his friend Seok Chan stays to watch over the trapped man. While he's gone, the prisoner warns Seok Chan that these people aren't planning to let any of them go and tells him to get out of there while he has the chance. He rushes to warn the commander, but is attacked and captured by a boy with a tentacle arm. The girl brings Sergeant Kim to the man in the suit, who says that they're going to mold the soldiers into one of them. Furious, Sergeant Kim is about to kill him, but the girl suddenly grows spiked tentacles from her back, pinning him to the ground. Meanwhile, the doctor encounters a mysterious cloaked man and follows him through the tunnels until they arrive at one of the labs. There, the figure reveals his true identity, the doctor's very first test subject and Yi Kyung's husband, Song Woon, who has become the parasitic monster. Back at the Green Home Apartments, a monsterized cocoon breaks open and the missing Yun Hook steps out into the moonlight as the monsters cower away from him. There's no telling what's going to happen next, but one thing is for sure, this monsterized nightmare is far from over. But what would you do? The world is already completely f***ed up, right? Monsters and people turning people into monsters and military people, guns and shit, survivors. Post-apocalyptic is f***ed out here in the streets. I feel like a post-apocalyptic world would just be my shit. Like, I, I, I'm just waiting for the world to go to shit and back so I could just walk around with my dog, Fallout style, but, but this is a little different. Let us know down in the comments below what you would do to survive this crazy shit. Sweet Home 2, it was a pleasure. That shit was too much fun. Leave a like and subscribe and check out that How To Be playlist for more videos just like this one. We gonna see you in the next video. All right, I'm gonna fuck with you and have a damn good day.